thanks to the European Academy of Religion for inviting me to Bologna to deliver this lecture. I'll try to imagine that I'm in enjoying the many cultural and gustatory wonders of that fine city as I deliver this lecture. My apologies in what follows for relying rhetorically on the inadequate convention of referring loosely to the sacred, the divine, the holy interchangeably without pausing to give more precise definitions of these divergent terms and for relying on a personal pronoun, his, to refer to a being, a spirit beyond gender. So let us begin. The title of my presentation is Hallowed Be Thy Name, Power and Glory in the Religious Imagination. Within the world's religious traditions, there is a historical tendency to sacralize or to otherwise justify a variety of behaviors by appealing to divine power or divine glory. By performing X or Y right or by enacting X or Y service or other ethical obligation, the community or the individual is understood to be giving glory and praise to God or to be sharing in divine glory. The religious acts warranted by or expressive of divine power and glory range from the communal or individual recitation of simple prayers to the ritual sacrifice of animals or human beings to the launching of military or terrorist attacks on the field of battle. Across this behavioral spectrum, the holiness and majesty of God is equated with, dependent upon, or manifest by divine power. In some quarters, as we shall see, the devout have interpreted divine power as merely the extrapolation of earthly power, that is, as the pure, unfettered essence of the kind of power wielded by the modern state, namely, the power to command, to control, to master, to dominate. Subtler and more inclusive notions of what might constitute divine majesty, of how one best serves the glory of God, have struggled to gain a foothold in newly ascendant religious subcultures. On the face of it, this conflation of the petty machinations of mortals and the awesome grandeur of the sacred is a curious phenomenon requiring explanation. The term glory, or its cognate, varies in meaning historically. The Hebrew word, which is used for glory in the Hebrew Bible, has the simple meaning of heaviness or weight. It was used in everyday speech to express the worth of a person in the physical or material sense. Over time, the term came to express the ideas of importance, greatness, honor, splendor, and not least, power. These associations can be found in the French and Latin roots of the term. Though not included in most New Testament accounts of the prayer Jesus taught his followers, the earliest Christians, and many still today, recite the following coda at the end of the Lord's Prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Indeed, Christian religious language is abounding in references to the glory, power, and might of the Most High. The Gloria, a hymn sung or recited most weeks in Catholic Mass, begins, Glory to God in the highest, and goes on to praise God for your glory. Countless acts of generosity, love, and self-sacrifice, large and small, are dedicated to the glorification of God. Muslims recite the now well-known and multivalent Arabic phrase, Allahu Akbar, in various situations, including the obligatory daily prayers. But the phrase has also entered into popular lexicon as a result of being invoked by some extremist Muslims engaged in violent and highly public acts of violence intended either to share in the glory of God or to exalt Allah. 
The literal translation of this phrase means God is greater. The phrase has a unique and complex history beyond its early use and conception. What will concern us here is the transmutation of such traditional and time-honored paeans to the glory of the Most High into rallying cries of religious extremists. What conception of the divine then lies behind this ubiquitous insistence on giving glory to God, on adoring and exalting God's majesty and dominant power? Does the Holy One in some way need the praise of His creatures? Or does the significance of attributing power and glory to the sacred lie not in a divine, but a very human need, such that the believer is somehow brought to greater depths of fulfillment or to greater heights of holiness by extolling and somehow partaking of the glory and power of the Creator, the Redeemer. I want to suggest in this paper that these connotations of the idea of the power and glory of the sacred propelled by the social dynamics and structural conditions of late modernity, play a central role in the modern religious imaginary. For certain religious subcultures, giving and receiving glory is associated with secular conceptualizations of prosperity, honor, and success, and with manifestations of power by the modern secular state. These religious subcultures, in turn, have spawned movements and networks that display an activist, aggressive, and militant form of religiosity. In their ideological traits and organizational dynamics, these proliferating militant movements reflect the merging of modern secular and traditionally religious sensibilities, practices, and goals. The emergence and evolution of this religious-secular hybrid yields insights into our conference theme of religion and power. Let's take an example. The emergence of religious Zionism in Israel during the latter half of the 20th century illustrates the blending of traditional religious and modern secular notions of divine power and glory with its profound implications for religious agency. The awe, fear, and trembling with which the people of Israel encountered the ferocious power of Yahweh is on display throughout the Hebrew Bible, most dramatically perhaps in the book of Exodus and the book of Job, where the gulf between absolute divine power and human contingency is vast and where the deity seems to crave publicity. English translations of a key text, Exodus chapter 14, verse 4, vary. Most striking is the following discourse of the Lord. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, so that I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. The medieval rabbinic commentator Rashi expounds, quote, When the Holy One, blessed be God, takes vengeance on the wicked, God's name is magnified and honored. And similarly, he continues, Scripture says in Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 22 through 23, I will punish him with pestilence and with bloodshed. Thus I will manifest my greatness and my holiness, and make myself known in the sight of many nations. And they shall know that I am the Eternal." In the Hebrew Bible, vengeance upon his enemies is reserved for the Lord God of hosts. The classic text is Deuteronomy 32, 35, but the theme reappears throughout in Leviticus, Numbers, Proverbs, and in other books. On the one hand, there is ample scriptural evidence that the Lord authorizes iconic figures such as Moses and David to serve His purposes through miracles, 
Wiley calculation, and temporal rule. Biblical era Judaism developed, developed several political models, including priestly theocracy. Alongside the rise of Jewish councils and other forms of religious and communal self-governance during the rabbinic and medieval periods, on the other hand, the political environment dictated, and one sees, a delicate and halting approach to political power and to secular authorities. Throughout Jewish experience, in any case, there is a thread of profound hesitation to connect the dots. That is, to leap to the conclusion that the necessary exercise of Jewish self-governance or power in this or that dispensation should be taken to correspond in some neat, obvious, or linear fashion to God's mysterious plan of salvation for the people of Israel. This hesitation changed in the 20th century. Following the Holocaust and the migration to Palestine, as Jews of various stripes were imagining the state of Israel into existence, this vein of trembling and fear before the transcendent power and inscrutable purposes of the Lord resurfaced in the modern Haredi movement, which rejected and denounced secular Zionist pretensions to establish an authentically Jewish state. And that Haredi movement isolated itself in enclaves dedicated to awaiting passively on the arrival of the Messiah. In the 1960s, however, and emerging fully in the 1970s in the wake of the near disastrous Yom Kippur War, an aggressive, confident, militant band of religious Zionists, the Gush Imunim or Bloc of the Faithful, convinced that the founding and survival of the state of Israel was prominent among the signs of the advent of the Messianic era, sought by their illegal settlements in, ter in territories occupied by Israel after the Six-Day War of 1967, and by their provocations of both Palestinian Arabs and the political leaders of the Israeli state, the Gush Emanim sought not only to hasten but actually to implement the divine plan. The movement's initial success in luring the government to consolidate its extra-legal incursions and to build state-funded settlements as part of a plan to eventually expand the borders of the state of Israel. Gushi Manim dreamed of an expansion to encompass the whole biblical land of Israel, quote, from the Nile to the Euphrates, this success was due in large part to the movement's very hybridity. The early core of Gush Emanim included both graduates of the Merkaz Harav Yeshiva, who are disciples of Rabbi Kook, and also secular activists hailing from previous land expansion campaigns in Israel. The operational wing of the movement placed modern communications and organizational technology at the service of irredentist messianism. Subsequently, underground elements studied and adopted modern terrorist tactics. Over time, the movement was domesticated, with numbers of its early members serving in the, serving in the Knesset and eventually assimilating into the Israeli political establishment. So the Gush Emanim, the Bloc of the Faithful, by one view, is a member of a global family of modern religion nationalisms. Religious nationalists of our day exceed the limits of mundane ultranationalism in two ways. <clears throat> First, they explicitly present the nation as sacred or as partaking of the sacred. Here the discourse of divine power and glory is pervasive. Second, the overt sacralization of the nation is practiced and believed by religious nationalists such as the Gush Emanim 
or the Hindutva, Hinduness movement in India. This is imagined as a vital step toward realizing the fulfillment of the religion itself. Judaism in the former case, Hinduism in the latter. One could mount a persuasive empirical argument that virtually all the major religious traditions in the past several decades have witnessed a movement toward what we might call the temporizing of divine power and its replacement by decidedly human empire building. While the Lord tarries was a favored locution of Bob Jones Sr., the founder of the Christian Fundamentalist University in Greenville, South Carolina, which bears his name. Jones recited this phrase regularly to explain and to justify why he and other Christian pastors had vowed not to wait upon the vengeance of the Lord, but to fight back against the 20th century onset of a hegemonic, godless culture desacralizing American institutions at the behest of an aggressive secular state. Put simply, the Lord was tarrying, postponing, he, postponing his prophesied and long anticipated return to earth and power and glory. And so the devout Christian must assume the mantle of the prophet, prepare the threshing floor, create the social and political conditions that would, as it were, lure the Lord into fulfilling, into fulfilling his promise of a triumphant return marked by a righteous display of purifying power. In order to grasp the militant intensity of this program, and its yearnings toward retributive violence on an apocalyptic scale, one need only consult the best-selling series of Christian novels published at the turn of the century and known as the Left Behind series in order to glimpse the contours of the religious imagination awakened in the 60 million American readers of the series. The series, if I may elaborate for a moment, was in multiple installments and was a fictionalized account of the unfolding of the end times in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, the latter in the New Testament. Its hero, Commander Rayford Steele, opens the series by flying across the Atlantic, a pilot who had fallen away from the faith, but who is concerned that his wife uh, had become too, evangel too evangelical, too fervid, too fundamentalist, had taken religion and issues of power and glory and dominance of God far too literally, far too seriously. As he's flying across the Atlantic and in fact contemplating an act of adultery with the stewardess, she comes up to him and says, Commander Steele, Captain Steele, half of the plane is empty. This is because the rapture has occurred, it turns out. The immediate taking up into heaven of the elect, the righteous, leaving behind the sinners in the Christian community and in the world beyond, who now must endure the final days, which both in the scriptures and in an even more vivid way in these novels, is the site of incredible bloodshed. One scene has the, the, um, the triumphant Lord returning in fury and lasers coming out of his eyes to destroy the enemies of God. The imagination here is apocalyptic, violent, exclusivist, highly politicized as well. This caught the imagination of the American evangelical and fundamentalist public. And it was seen as an appropriate projection of the ways in which a sacred remnant must give glory to the Lord upon his return.
This is just one reference to popular culture in American Christianity. It certainly doesn't speak for the majority of Christians, and one can extrapolate from 60 million readers or sales of, of these novels into a firm confidence in every piece of, of the writing. But it is striking, and it's one of numerous examples within fundamentalist Christian subculture of a focus, even a fixation, on the requirements in, this, in these latter days, often violent requirements, certainly militant, of standing up for and preparing for the return of God in God's full glory and honor. In building this robust and sprawling religious subculture in the United States, the fundamentalists use various tactics, but separatism, withdrawal, leaving the end times to God, letting God be God, which was a previous tactic earlier in the history, this separatist tactic was not among the tactics in the latter part of the century. The narrowing of the imagination and the options for believers seems true mutatis mutandis of modern Roman Catholics and Muslims as well as others. It was not just the province of evangelical and fundamentalist Christians in the late 20th century. The separatist or quietist option seemed to be off the table. The requirements of upholding God's glory and enacting it led believers in large numbers to an aggressive militant stance against the other. Until fairly recently, textbook portrayals, which are inevitably reductive, of Judaism, Sunni Islam, and Protestant Christianity clustered traits observed within these communities around the tendency to organize communal life and practice on the basis of the doctrine of absolute divine sovereignty. In their own different ways, these communities performed the vast gulf between the absolute power and glory of God on the one hand and the feeble striving of the sinful or, disobedi or disobedient human subject on the other. Likewise, according to this particular typology, the accuracy of which is less important to us than its ubiquity, Roman Catholic Christians, Shia Muslims, and the majority of Hindus were said to list toward a theological anthropology or a cosmology, in Hinduism's case, which bridged the gulf between the human and the divine agency. For example, the analogical imagination of Catholicism in particular, it was noted, authorizes forms of imitatio dei or imitatio Christi, the imitation of God or the imitation of Christ by the devout, the walking in Christ's path. According to this shared family resemblance or common general perspective on the sacred, saints, martyrs, and other religious virtuosi are believed to be participants in the divine drama, partakers of divine glory, avatars of the transcendent. If the metaphor ever became military, which it did, they were considered soldiers of God, or some cognate term. In short, this analogical imagination gave rise in some religious subcultures to an activist orientation, to a dedication to change the world, to bring the kingdom to this world, not always violently, not necessarily violently, but opening itself to a variety of militant options, some violent, others nonviolent. Earlier modern as well as medieval Catholics still living on earth, for example, were not yet considered members of what was called the church triumphant. That was reserved for those who had gone to their eternal reward and were basking in the reflected glory of God in heaven. But rather, those still on earth 
were considered foot soldiers of what was called the church militant, fighting battles for God's kingdom on earth. As this reading of religious history has it, the, use, the uses, purposes, and functions of divine power and divine glory were conceived and practiced differently by these respective apophatic and cataphatic or analogical imaginations. So in short, divine and human powers and glories were never so intermingled as in the Catholic view, never more isolated one from the other in the classic Protestant sensibility. I'll pause here and elaborate. This is not to say that these ideal types of Shia, Muslims, and Catholics, and Hindus on one hand, or uh, Sunni Muslims and Protestant Christians uh, and Jews on the other, even began to capture the nuances of the sensibilities and practices of these diverse, uh, highly populated religious subcultures and religions themselves. They weren't, there, they weren't meant to capture the subtleties. They were simply drawing attention to orientations toward the world, toward God's power and glory, and toward human agency. And these options were available across these traditions and within them. That is, the option to interpret God's glory and power and one's responsibility to it in a variety of ways. So that a very privileged interpretation was awe and trembling and fear in the face of sovereignty exercised by God, of God's absolute power and glory that lent itself in some cases to, again, a withdrawal, a quietism, a focus on building the internal community of faith, belief, practice, to prayer, to contemplation, and so on, without a concomitant impulse or imperative to move beyond that enclave or community into the larger world for the purposes of some kind of conquest, spiritual or otherwise. And yet over time, as we'll see, that particular option available in the menu or the repertoire of religions seemed to diminish in favor of the analogical option, which already was imagining God in a way that lessened the distance between the sovereign absolute God and human striving, human efforts, so that the questions of power and glory were shared responsibilities on the part of the deity and the deity's followers. So, the question before us is whether this previous diversity of religious worldviews and behaviors has collapsed under the pressure of what Anthony Giddens has called late modernity. It may well be that separatism, a quietist withdrawal from political belligerence, is simply no longer an option available to most modern religious actors, especially those who feel increasingly besieged by the encroachments of an undiluted state-sponsored secularism. This certainly seemed to be the conclusion of the Shiite followers of the Ayatollah Khomeini, who cast off a long tradition of political quietism observed during the many centuries while the hidden imam tarried, to use Bob Jones' term. And they took up the tactics of revolution in order to overthrow the hapless Shah of Iran. The strategy of the Iranian revolutionaries, the Israeli Jewish settlers, the Christian fundamentalists, the Hindu nationalists, seem to be, if you can't beat undiluted secularism, then dilute it, join it, so to speak. But in so doing, refine it, turn it to religious ends, to, quote, the glorification of the Lord Ram as an RSS leader urged the phalanx of young Swayamsevaks who marched on the iconic Babri Mosque in 1992 in order to demolish it. 
the divine majesty and the power emanating therefrom is now placed at the service of identifying, protecting, and militarizing the elect, the chosen ones, the elite spiritual vanguard, and casting all others into the fire. This is the way to glorify God. In this aspiration in itself, there is nothing new or modern. But I want to call attention to the specific ironies, reversals, and unintended outcomes incumbent on those of our own time who have chosen to evoke ancient hatreds through the means of modern political ideologies and enabling technologies. The members of the multi-layered Hindutva movement seek to reify the historically sprawling and disparate practices of the, Und in the, of the Indus Valley region and beyond, precisely making those practices a religion called Hinduism in order to lend plausibility to their portrayal of polyglot, religiously plural, and secular India as somehow a homogenous Hindu nation. This dual move, sacralizing the nation and glorifying it as the cornerstone or summit of orthodox or orthoprax religion, lends a transcendent or metaphysical or psychological depth to exclusionary social norms and discriminatory politics that mere irredentism or politics as usual could not provide with such force. The nation is absolute because it partakes of the sacred. The sacred is bound up in the destiny of the nation. In his study of Hindus and Muslims in late 20th century India, Peter Vanderveer writes, quote, In the construction of the Muslim other by Hindu nationalist movements, Muslims are always referred to as a dangerous foreign element, as not truly Indian. Control over sacred centers of the nation and ritual sites is not only crucial to the power of religious elites, but is a source of continuous struggle between religious movements. The problem facing secular political leaders is the state's diminishing capability to arbitrate conflicts in a society characterized by a plurality of cultures. Thus far, Vanderveer. One can readily see how the definition of nation as coterminous with the history and prerogatives of a particular ethno-religious and racial subset of the population is abetted by the construction of that subset as the originally chosen people. The politics of exclusion fed by radical populism and right-wing nationalism, becomes ever more powerful then when minorities are depicted as displacing the rightful heirs of the sacred trust and are thereby easily demonized, not merely as aliens, foreigners, and outsiders, but as impure and somehow even less than fully human and therefore presented as justifiable targets of violence and other forms of coercion. Violence which, in the eyes of the Hindu soldiers, gives glory to the Lord Ram. What has happened then to the previous obvious available diversity of religious modalities? This is a complicated question, and there has been a great deal written about it. I can only here summarize some of the major points of parts of the literature. In doing so, I would posit that both the world and the religions have indeed changed throughout the course of the great Western transmutation, the 20th century, a transformation so se seismic that it was called the great Western transmutation by the mid 20th century historian of Islam, Marshall Hodgson. Hodgson called it that 
because it both revealed the inadequacy of the old models, this great Western transmutation. It revealed the inadequacy of the old models and ideal types and also rendered them obsolete. A word on this. What was included in the great Western transmutation, the technological advances in communication, in education, in travel, and so on that we now take for granted, Hodgson and many others have noted, transformed internally the way that moderns, modern citizens, modern religious believers perceive the world, think, and behave. Our understanding of religious dynamics and evolutions have continually evolved, but so rapidly have these religions themselves under the pressure of late modernity. By whatever label we use for it, the late modern era, roughly the period from the mid-19th century to the present, with its effects accumulating special power and increased authority over the last 50 to 75 years, this period has witnessed a conflation and then an overtaking of these historically divergent and heterogeneous Muslim, Hindu, Jewish, and Christian theologies I've referred to within and across these multi-generational modern religious communities, indeed, we have seen the rise of an alternative mode of religiosity, labeled variously fundamentalism, ultra-orthodoxy, neo-traditionalism, a variety of terms and uh, of these disparate movements with their own complexities. Whatever we call this emergence, the ideologically driven instrumentalization of a previous analogical vision of the relationship between human agency and divine power has reduced this richly elusive mode of religious imagination, the analogical imagination, to the merely mundane or secular imperatives of a narrow political theology. Meanwhile, the separatist option a withdrawing from political action to the domain of prayer and community building, which had formerly been authorized by the via negativa, that is, God is nothing like man, and so man must fall on his knees in supplication and in obedience to adore. This world and world, worldly power renouncing option has become increasingly difficult to realize in a world bent on encroaching upon, invading, infecting, the separatists might, separatists might say, every sacred haven or enclave. That is to say, the dynamics of late modernity seem to be making it very difficult to preserve a sense of giving glory and power, acknowledgement of the power of God, apart from the fray the political, ideological, military fray that seems to be, as they would put it, infecting uh, the late modern world. An exa concrete example of this tendency may be useful here. The, ra the rabbi and scholar Haim Soloveitchik has written eloquently of the transformation of the 20th century Jewish community under the pressure of a nascent Jewish variant on fundamentalism or neo-traditionalism. And this movement displaced, he says, the local authority of the family and the community in favor of a new role for the rabbi, in favor of overweening rabbinic and scholarly policing of conforming to, uh, of, of whether or not Jews were conforming to newly set standards of orthodoxy, to instructive text upon text. Soloveitchik talks about the proliferation of text in modern Judaism beyond the texts that were already the center of the traditional faith. So the proliferation of how-to manuals, 
and how-to text and laws and behavioral codes, that this arose as if Jews were forgetting after the Holocaust how to be Jews, how to practice the faith they had learned from their parents in their families and their local communities. Now it seemed necessary to impose a regimen, a regulation, uh, a regimen that in some ways imitated, was an awkward mimesis of secular ways of organizing and authorizing behavior. Soloveitchik describes this transformation within the Jewish community as a shift from a culture of mimesis to a culture of performance. And in this shift, the fear of God was lost, he says, replaced by the fear of the rabbi. If I can elaborate on this for just a second. Soloveitchik's concern was precisely the erosion of a lived and felt sense of Judaism that acknowledge the glory and majesty of God as a reality to be worshiped, to be studied in and of itself, not to be mastered or manipulated, or to have behaviors accrue that would somehow um, uh, uh, treat this manifestation of power and glory as a political tool or as a set of manipulations around the sociological and political survival of the community. So Vicek mourned what he saw as the reduction of that organic sense of holiness, of participation in God's glory, the reduction of that experience into a mere recitation of laws, following of instructions, and therefore a distancing of the community from the lived experience of the Almighty God. Such depredations have occurred in many communities under the pressure of modern secular ideologies and late modern processes of hybridization and politicization far beyond or apart from religious communities themselves. Contemporary and recent reformist, revolutionary, fundamentalist, and other politicized social movements have emerged in the, this context of a kind of hyper-modernity, an era characterized by unprecedented globalizing trends, ideologies of nationalism, and the omnipresent totalizing nation state. It is the nation state to which glory and honor seems to be due. In this milieu, religion is seldom the sole player and religious actors themselves are highly susceptible to worldviews and habits of mind embedded in structures and processes derived not from religious, but from worldly, that is, secular trajectories. Accordingly, innumerable books and articles have been published over the last number of decades that modify the category religious violence by embedding religious agency within encompassing nationalist and ethnic narratives and ideologies. I call these manifestations of religion that have capitulated to nationalisms and ethnic chauvinisms. My term for this is examples of weak religion, that is religion that is not able to stand on its own to include a prophetic resistance to the secularization, the overtaking of the religious sensibility by secular or state secular modes of operation. Many of these accounts subordinate the religious motivations and dynamics of violence prone actors, inaccurately in some cases, and also a recurrent explanation for the dependent role of religious actors arises within mixed movements, that is, the mixed motives of religious actors themselves. This speaks to the vulnerability of religious leaders and institutions, to the manipulations of state, nationalists, and ethnic forces in their societies. The religious element, that is, is relatively weak. <laughs> 
the largely overlooked dimension of this pattern of sanctification and of the deepening of secular trends within religion is the way that giving glory to God has been interpreted by modern religious actors. The wielding of shabby worldly power now appears as central to the fulfillment of this obligation. In this context, the lived meaning of power and of glory is woefully truncated. Demographically, alas, it is now the tentative, the religious moderates who prefer to worship God in God's glory rather to enact that glory themselves. It is these religious actors who seem to be the sacred remnant. Thank you for your attention.